All right, good point. Uh, there was a question of can you use fruits to make fermented plant juices? Yes, there is a type of fermented plant juice called fermented fruit juice, and you would use that during the fruiting phase of uh, your plants. So um, if your plants are already flower set, but yet haven't set fruit, what a better time to add those hormones that are in those that fruit set um, to your to your plants. So I would recommend you know your citrus if you have citrus it doesn't have to be even that plant citrus it can be any kind of citrus make a fermented plant uh, fruit juice out of that and then use that as a uh, as an applicant like for your pineapple rinds and stuff like that yeah 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 but you still adding the sugar everything is a huh still adding the sugar and all yep like it's still a one to one yeah one to one by weight yes Oh, wait a minute, what's one to one? Yeah, sure. General fruit juice. I mean, like I said, when it's all broken down, it all gets fermented and broken down into a molecule of cytokinin, gibberellic acid, oxid. The plant doesn't know the difference. It's The molecule is still the same. It recognizes the molecule. It doesn't recognize it if it made it itself, and it will take it up. We've proven that in science. Well, that's what the By commercial guys do. You know, they, they got a commercial on fructose and mm -hmm. uh, regular sugar, yep. cane sugar. Mm -hmm. The plant doesn't know, it. doesn't know the difference. That's what they say. They make that claim. So, is that what you're saying? Yeah, a lot in farming, I would say the plant doesn't know the difference, um, but the microbes around and the associations that they have with the plant do. Yeah. So, like, I'll say that when you add a conventional fertilizer, versus an organic fertilizer, the plant can't tell the difference because the plant takes up ions. And if it's an ion of nitrate, it will take it up. No matter where it comes from, it doesn't care. Uh, the reason why organic amendments work a little bit better than conventional is because they come with other constituents. They come with micronutrients and they come with organic matter. So the plant doesn't still doesn't know the difference but the microbes that have those associations with the roots have that special relationship with soil organic matter and, and these wonderful things and that's where the difference in the improvement of plant health comes from oh in fact I think what they said was your body doesn't know mm -hmm. the difference yeah the same thing the plant doesn't know the difference your body when you take a vitamin your body's like mmm calcium it it takes it up the same way but do your microbe Got, got, does that react the same way and do you lose that type of symbiotic relationship if you're supplementing your calcium in a water soluble form that gets taken up in your first instance of your, of your, of your small intestine? Yeah. Okay, questions? Um, is there any chance of propagating when you're doing the uh, fermentation process? Like if you're taking a bunch of peel on Miley or something, is there any chance that it's gonna like survive the fermentation process? No way. Yeah. Our organic material will get broken down right away. It gets turned into glucose, and then it gets turned into another form of sugar, and eventually ending up as lactic acid. Uh, no organic <coughs> material is gonna withstand really that fermentation process. <coughs> Sorry, no plant organic material. Questions? Let's get stinky. Do some fish. All right, guys. Uh, what was this? Rented plant juice? Well, it's fake because it kind of put water in it. I'm sure it has some wonderful properties to it. And a great personality. And a great personality. What will the plant do with this I am going to need. Is there any more jars in there? Um. You know what, I'll just use that because that's what that is. It's the fish base. Okay. Actually, no, I can't. I don't I don't need a jar because I didn't make any a week ago for you guys. Okay, let's make some and then learn how, how it turns out. Under the box. All, all of these so far are in mature plants, right? These would all be used in mature plants. 
Let's talk about it first. Fish amino acids. FAA, fish emulsion, it's called a lot of things. I call it macronutrient fertilizer is essentially what it is. So we're talking about high levels of nitrogen, high levels of calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, sulfur. <clears throat> There's definitely going to be anything in a plant and an animal body, those types of nutrients that make up those structures are going to be present in the fish amino acids. Okay? And a lot of those are plant uptakeable and used by the plants. So as a main nutrient source in natural farming, fish amino acid should be used widely in the production of other natural farming amendments and then also as a plant foliar and soil foliar um, applicant. So, nitrogen. Yeah, leaches away, right? It's pretty hard to find in nature. It's, uh, it's, it's the one element that really makes it or breaks it for the life of a lot of plants. If there isn't nitrogen available, it just doesn't do well, even if it has everything else. Uh, it needs it in very, very large quantities. Does anybody who took the class on Wednesday want to tell me why nitrogen is important? Give me two reasons. Come on. <laughs> I was getting ready to leave that. Yeah, I know you were. <laughs> anybody? I left. <laughs> we were talking specifically oh, about photosynthesis oh, photosynthesis and energy. Manufacturing. Well, that's phosphorus. One of the main constituents and the main parts of ATP, which we learned about for in that class for about an hour, hour and a half, which is the it's the energy currency of cells, and it's how cells transfer energy between each other. ATP, a main constituent of ATP is nitrogen, and then another main constituent is the phosphorus. Right. So, in order for cells to transfer energy, you need to have nitrogen. One of the main elements in cell structure is nitrogen. Um, it is used in almost all enz enzymes. So we're talking about like biological activity, structure, and function. Pretty much these things are major, major issues when it comes to plants. So why not add a natural fertilizer as opposed to even just crumbles and all that stuff. Because when you buy a fertilizer, you are given a minimum amount of nitrogen that's in there, right? That's minimum. It's really kind of, it's a question, it's actually how much nitrogen is in there. Um, and if you're putting too much nitrogen in or not enough, it's, it's, it's tough to say what is in a nutrient, a, a fertilizer nutrient that you're buying from the store. Like I said, because there's a minimum amount, and you don't know how much the max or like what the maximum could be. Um, with something like this, the nitrogen levels in fish amino acid will never, ever, ever get above five, maybe nine. I would say nine would be the highest it would ever get as far as percentage of nitrogen. So it would be pretty tough to burn your plants. This is a great um, organic amendment as far as nitrogen goes. But the best part about it is it's water soluble. So can anyone name to me an organic amendment, a nitrogen amendment that's water, that comes water soluble? Calcium. No, like give me a fertilizer or something out there that is water soluble. None of them. None of them come out really as a liquid, uh, except for fish emulsion. Calcinate. Huh? Calcinate. Calcinate? Yeah, for uh, hydroponics. And that's organic? Yeah. Oh. No, it's synthetic. So as far as organic amendments go, it's really rare to find them in a liquid form. Okay, in a liquid form, they're pretty much totally plant uptakeable. You don't have to go through any changes. But if you put out a nitrogen fertilizer that's ammonia, it has to go to nitrate and a nitrite to nitrate before it can be taken up by plants. So what I'm saying here is what you are able to make is a organic fertilizer amendment that's water soluble and high nitrogen, which is something that you generally can't find on the market. Why? 
because we live in Hawaii and it's incredibly expensive to ship this stuff and nobody can even afford to do it. And then if you can, you go to the greenhouse store and these these hydroponic shops and they put $25 for bottles of nitrogen of fish emulsion or whatever, which is essentially what we're making right here. So what I'm trying to do is save you a ton of money and I'm letting you know you don't need to buy too many, if at all, nitrogen fertilizers if you use fish amino acid. The NPK that we're getting for fish amino acid typically is 511. The same as fish emulsion that you buy in the store for $28 a gallon. If you're able to source the fish, it's a great way to do it. Okay, so um, I also use it in IMO production. So IMO two, oh, sorry, IMO three and IMO four, I use this material. Um, why? Because IMO has a lot of carbon in it, and if you don't even out the amount of carbon in anything with the amount of nitrogen in it then there's decomposition and breakdown issues. Okay, does anybody know what the CN ratio is? I talk about that in the soils class about soil organic matter. There's a relationship for the amount of carbon and nitrogen that is in compost, for example. If you have too much carbon and not enough nitrogen, your compost will slowly, if not at all, break down. If you have too much nitrogen and not enough carbon, you're gonna have you're gonna have really bad microbial issues, some lots of heat, and then eventually you're gonna have anaerobic conditions. Decomposition going way too hot and way too fast. Okay, so there's a relationship with carbon and nitrogen. In IMO, there's a lot of carbon in there. In the mill run, there's, there's a decent amount of nitrogen, but for the amount of microbial activity that goes on in this material, you need to add nitrogen to your IMOs. In my experiment that I'm doing for my research, I'm not adding any of this stuff, uh, and I'm seeing the differences um, of ones that are amended with a nitrogen fertilizer and ones that aren't. The temperatures for the ones that are added with the nitrogen fertilizers are getting up to 130 degrees within 12 hours of making the materials, which is super fast. If I don't put the nitrogen materials, it could be two or three days before I get those temperatures. So what that's indicating to me is, this is like steroids to microorganisms during decomposition. So you would be wise to add it foliarly to your plant, to your root base, and also to the any organic material that is around your plants. Because you want that decomposition to happen, the breakdown and the release of those micronutrients and nutrients to your plant. So this is a, also a catalyst for decomposition. Okay, so straight so a into nutrient the compost amendment too, right? and a catalyst, huh? Straight into the compost as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Compost pile. Yeah, yeah. So I would always add nitrogen to my compost pile. Most people add chicken manure or something. The issue is chicken manure in a compost pile gets wet, volatilizes, you lose a lot of the nitrogen. If you're using a water soluble version, it goes in, it goes onto the soil organic material, it gets locked in, the microorganisms instantly absorb it, and it's used and it doesn't volatilize as well. So that would be also uh, uh, 500. No, I lied. This is a thousand. Oh. And I'll get to that when we make it. Okay, so. Um, I need a if you do nothing in natural farming, use this stuff for real. It works great. If this is the only thing you do in natural farming, you will be than not using it at all. I need a volunteer! Alright! Get in there. <laughs> Here are my rubber gloves that I use. Hey man, it's your choice. I wear my grubby stuff. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Am I going to get grubby? It's up to you. And how, how well you're doing. Alright, so, what do we got here guys? Fish, fish oh, like skins, heads, bones, fins, flesh. flesh, guts. Guts is super important. Got a lot of the sulfur and stuff in there. Um, and you can, used to be able to get this from Suisan for nothing if you showed up before 10 o'clock. Uh, like I said, there's an issue. 
He said he'll still charge, so if you feel like paying, not a big deal. But if you think about this, I can make four gallons of this stuff, and what is he gonna charge me, 10 bucks? Four gallons of fish emulsion for 10 bucks, it's a pretty damn good deal. With just this amount, you can make four gallons? Um, you can make about, with just that amount, maybe two gallons. But I would have filled the bucket up. But I didn't, I didn't want to grab too much because it's just an example. So you, you're, we're talking one unit is one gallon full, one, one five gallon yeah, full of stuff. Right. So he'll sell that for 10 bucks. I don't know how much he'll start, charge, but if oh. I was to choose, I would say somewhere right around five or 10 bucks, you know, for a five gallon bucket seems reasonable. But I don't know what he's going to charge, or if he even will at all, but he told me that this morning and I'm, I'm really kind of But he said, James, you can come anytime, you're all good. So hey, I'm, a, I'm good. So what, the goal here is, when we're making fish amino acid, <clears throat> is to create layers. And we're going to create layers of fish and layers of sugar. So in a five gallon bucket, or preferably a terracotta pot, you want to take fish and lay it on the bottom of your bucket. Go right ahead. This much layer? Um, maybe up to about here. So maybe three or four inches. So we bought some from a local fisherman. What's some? Uh, we bought a big uh, 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 mahi mahi. Okay. And we kept all the skin, all, yep. the, all the body parts. So we can certainly just store that up in the freezer. And then when time comes, we can use that, right? Yeah, or just make this stuff and then you can store it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay. So you don't have to freeze it and all that issue. There's no, is there Go ahead and put meat? another one. Is there any meat in here? Is it just... It's uh, side meat and um, if it's connected to the fins or something. Yeah, there's a nice gut. You get to grab that with a head. Wow. Okay. That's some mahi. Mahi. That's mahi. Yeah. So yeah, so we'll put like a nice thick layer in the bottom like this. So there's only going to be two layers. Well, most you can only do in a five-gallon bucket is usually two layers. Uh, next, we're going to add sugar, and it's not what I do with sugar. It's not so much a weight thing as it is you want to take. You want to be a volunteer with muscle. Oh, yeah. He's got. He's got. He's got. You're, you're on fish. Oh. So let's dump enough sugar on top of this and pat it down so that you can't see any fish sticking out the top. So we want a total layer of sugar all the way across the top. This process takes a lot of sugar, guys. And where do you get these? Uh... HFM or Waihata usually charge about 90 cents a pound. If you go to the grocery oh, store, sugar, I mean, yes, yeah. they go to the grocery store, they usually charge about $2 a pound. So HFM? Yeah, HFM, great way to go. Go ahead and put some more. That, those couple fins is okay, but yeah. So you made a really nice layer on top. And we're gonna go ahead and put the rest of the fish in. And we'll layer right up on top of that with some more sugar. Good. All right. You're ready to go. This is any kind of fish. The weight on this thing that transfers over to the amount of material. I mean, you're gonna get gallons of stuff out of this. Um, so that material is going to sit right there in layers, and what we're going to do is just our gas exchange. Allow for gas exchange. We're going to take a little water from it on top. And the, the paper towel, the wire situation is super crucial that you get it all the way to the edge, which is why I don't like using a wire. Do I have rubber bands in there? Yeah, yeah, okay, bit. see? This is where I would use definitely use a rubber band. Good. Okay. Boop, 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 boop. See, now I have, there's no way a fly is going to get up in there. Maybe even do two or three of them because sometimes the flies will push, or the beetles will push and get up underneath there and then lay madness in here. So, 
<laughs> Gotta be really careful of the insects in this. This will attract flies for about three days. So you wanna put it in a container or some way away from your house. Um, it's not gonna stink too much, but it will attract flies. So you just gotta be careful. Um, after about three days, the amount of alcohol that builds up in here, um, it, it really isn't that much of a stink anymore. So you don't have to worry about it that much. It's really those three days, you gotta make sure the pigs stay away from it. If you got dogs, you gotta make sure that they stay away from this thing. My dogs will chew straight through the paper towel and get in there and they come with their whole head covered and they're happy as clams. So <laughs> just be really careful with this stuff. It can make your animals sick. There's there's a lot of bad stuff in there, so be really, really careful. Can you just put this in a drum? Uh, sure, put it in a drum and then your dogs can get near it or whatever. Uh, but you want to make sure that there is that gas exchange, you want to make sure it's out of sunlight, and within eight days, seven or eight days, you can do your first harvest of the materials in this bucket. Okay? What it's going to look like when you open it up is there's going to be a crusty layer on top of fungi. There's going to be the floating uh, fish matter on top and then uh, a very very thick viscous sugary material on the bottom okay what you want to do is get that sh thick viscous sugary material off the bottom um, and you do that by using the bucket and the strainer that you put the strainer right up over top and just get that material out when you harvest the material you put it into a jar with plenty of air space and then uh, you can just store it. There's so much sugar in here, you don't really need to add much, much else. Um, the microbial activity is kind of non-existent because of the amount of nitrogen that is in here. So the, as far as like adding sugar over time, it's really not that big of a deal. You'll learn that it doesn't really stink. Like it smells though, or something. It smells like like the decomposed material, but it doesn't like it doesn't have this horrendous stench to it. Why? Because all the ammonia and sulfur and methane are out of it. It's a stable form of the nitrogen. So it's really just pure liquid nitrogen. Yeah, that's, and, and there's a lot of other good stuff in there as well. Right. Okay. You know, so I've been, then I've been trying to figure out what to do with all the mongoose <laughs> that I shoot. You know, like yeah. I just. Pit, yeah, just ferment them, dude. That was thinking. <laughs> Good luck with that. No, I'll call you. I'll call you when I start doing it. <laughs> yeah, I, I go to KTA. I see up on the the shelf of mongoose juice. Oh, oh really? I would totally buy that. Oh, okay. Gino's mongoose juice. Yeah, I would buy that. <laughs> okay, so after about eight days, you strain it out, and what comes out is this stuff, which is like I said, it's got a. It's got a very red, bloody color when it comes out. Okay, so this batch is, that one's about a year old, and this is about four or five months old. Different properties to it. <laughs> you know what, this this smells like the uh, shrimp or bagong. Mm -hmm. The shrimp one. Or the even just, you know people, instead of making this stuff, they buy yeah, fish sauce mm -hmm. and they use it in the same way. They go to the <coughs> Kikoman fish sauce and they use it the same way. It's smart. It's essentially the same stuff. Right, right. Piece. <laughs> so that's not like, it's not, it, don't, it doesn't turn you off. Like you're not like, oh, but it's, it's definitely pungent and potent, right? Well, that's because as you open it up, that nitrogen is turning into ammonia and, and there's oh, sulfur okay. released and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's just going to be three layers here, the top well, fungal thing. Right? Yeah, yeah. it's going to be like a crispy fungal layer. Yeah. And then there's going to be, um, especially if you put the innards in, the bladder uh, yeah. will uh, blow up. Yeah. And it'll push everything towards the top. And then uh, usually I'll, when I put it in, I try to scour that bladder so that that doesn't happen. But every once in a while it'll blow up with gas. So it'll actually push all the material up to the top. So it actually gives a nice kind of filtering to it. Uh, and then you just, just dump it out and you're left over with still plenty of bones, heads, and all that stuff. Because in eight days, 
The only thing that's taken out of it is the liquids, yeah. the amino acids, the fats, um, and the water that's in there. A little bit of the protein. What's left is recognizable fish parts still after eight days. When, that, when I pull that head out, it's going to look like that in eight days. Mm -hmm. There's two phases to fish amino acid. You take out that first phase, which is this stuff, and then this stuff is actually second phase. In second phase is, after you harvest the first amount, you add sugar again, leave it layered up over top, and you let it sit for like six months. Okay? So you split it into to two. And you don't really need it? to. At that just, point, there's just it's just a gooey mess okay. in the bottom. I would just put sugar right up on over top, top and then just put that up on, and then just forget about it for several months. So what you're doing there is now you're breaking down those bones, you're breaking down the tissues. Just like the bones. Yeah. The cow. And, but the first initial was a lot of that amino acid in blood. Blood, just plain blood is incredibly good nitrogen source for plants, okay? So what you're doing is that first step is you're getting all the liquidy stuff out of the material, and then now you're going to get the more the, the harder structural components of that, that animal material taken out, okay? So seven months later, let's see what it looks like. <laughs> Second batch, yeah. Yep, this is second. Oops, those are both. <laughs> the other one. Mm. Wow. So you're gonna get a couple of grubs here and there. They're always gonna find them. Right? Oh wow. There's movement in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that thing's alive, man. Why with the sound here. of music? Chicken food. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Do you see the tissues still? Yeah. 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 So this is obviously part of the ribs and the gills. So if you I would not call it, that gross, but you, you covered it better. You wouldn't have the gross, right? What I call this is enough nitrogen fertilizer for 20 acres for a year. Oh. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> so. Chopped up, mixed up. Notice how I just pushed on the flesh and it literally just melted off those bones. But you have a big mixer and just mix them up till it's liquefied. Sure, sure, sure. That's what you know. Fish emulsion. What they do is when they finish, they blend it. So I was catching hoggy and did the same thing. It come out that way. Trigger fish. Any kind of fish? <laughs> no, not any kind of fish. Yeah. It is recommended to use blueback fish, so the large predatory fish. Mm. They have a lot more amino acids in them. Anything that's a predator is going to have more amino acids. Um, large blueback. If it has a blueback in any of the, the uh, subspecies, then it's probably the right fish. So. Sharks, salmon, tuna, jacks. These big guys. Yeah? I need the gray. Where did the gray go? Uh, oh. Oh. Where's my volunteer? You got the gloves, man. I'm retired. <laughs> You retired somebody else. Come on, get in there, get wet, get dirty. The gloves. You might want the gloves. For yeah, you might want the gloves. Oh, he doesn't care. Huh? Yeah, but doesn't people gotta live around him for the next right? day. Does. <laughs> I remember. I remember pulling. I pulled up to this guy's house one day, and I come down and I go, "What the hell is going on in your front area?" And he's like, "Oh, I made some fish amino acid." And I'm like, "No, you didn't. <laughs> you made death." <laughs> <laughs> you put it in a bucket and left it in the sun. Yeah, that will do it. Oh, man. Stuck up the whole street. You need another bucket. Yeah. Hold on. I need to get this. Just throw that material in here.
in Philly right now? Um, they will push the rubber bands. Those aren't maggots. Those are cockroach larvae. So oh. maggots are tiny, huh? And right. they really oh, just like aerobic conditions. Those cockroach larvae, the big palmettos, that's what that is. Which are decomposers, eh? Yeah. And a great indication that you have healthy soil if you have that stuff, those things running around your area. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, right means you have a really nice um, trophic system because if they're there, then centipedes are there. If you have centipedes in your garden, you actually have a really good trophic system. Yeah. It means that there's there's people eating from the top all the way down to the nematodes and the microbes. You can't have the top guys without the bottom guys. Well, my place 10 years ago had thousands of centipedes. Right now it's nothing. Did you do anything different? Did you add soil organic matter? All, did all your neighbor, the... did your neighbor bulldoze? No, you put no. Well, the place was bulldozed when I got there, so it might have came. Why well, I went to different areas. <laughs> put that in the magic block. Yeah, well, it might have <laughs> you know, I had a whole bunch of chicks, and you know, they die and stuff like that. So I opened up the uh, bucket and I threw them inside. And I forgot about it one time. And I forgot about it like almost a year. And my kids, my son's guys went to clean up the farm and everything like that. And they opened that bugger up and oh, it, boom, it hit him, man. Oh. <laughs> they asked me, what is that? I said, oh, plant food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you, you guys see how this process can go really sour really fast. <laughs> um, if you have the wrong conditions, Wrong heat, sunlight hitting it, you don't have the right aeration, you don't have the right stuff. You're talking major bug issues. You're talking rats coming, you're talking all this stuff. So you gotta be really careful Our that you're doing these correctly. But. Good training. Yeah, good job. So yeah, so like second phase, right? Oh, don't worry about it, man, for real. Good lord, it's enough for a very long time. Leave it for Chris, the guys, to come clean it up on Monday. Yeah, don't tell him we were here. <laughs> he will know I was here. <laughs> phase two, fish amino acid. All right? So, a lot more calcium, a lot more magnesium, not as much nitrogen. But if there is nitrogen, it's a more stable nitrogen than that stuff the first phase coming out, which is mostly just blood. So can you really explain what's happening with the sugar? Is you, like, what's sugar is uh, feeding microorganisms, okay. and those are decomposing the flesh and make, uh, breaking apart the complex molecules that are the, the fish. So they become, they're, they're complex carbon mo molecules for meat and for tissue and for tendon and it slowly knocks apart those molecules until it uh, becomes water soluble. Okay? Yeah. So, so what's, it's, what's it's, the mix on this then? A uh, thousand to one. Still thousand yep. to one. Yep. Pretty much the same composition as the first batch, phase yeah. one. Different, huh? yeah, different, different concentration of nutrients, certainly. So you're gonna have, a lot, like I said, a lot more calcium, magnesium in this one. That's almost all nitrogen and water. Right. Because that one draws everything from the bones now. Correct. Yeah. Taking it from the cells of the skin, which have high fats. And when those fats are processed with a little bit of nitrogen or phosphorus, it, you'll have a different result in the end, in the end result um, because of the parent material in which it comes from. Okay, so when we're talking the first phase, it's a lot of it is just osmotic pressure, pulling moisture and blood out of the meat. This phase is more decomposition, right? So is fermentation happening? Fermentation happens on the first one because of the sugars and microorganisms. As soon as you have sugar and microorganisms in anaerobic conditions, then you have fermentation. But not so much second. Yep, yeah, same same thing the second time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because I added more sugar and remember I add more sugar and then it just kickstarts a new fermentation process. So is it continuing to happen in a jar? Yes, yes. It does. Um, I've never held it long enough where like I've had it for like two or three years to know if it still did like some kind of sort of gas release 
after two or three years. I go through it so quickly with my classes. And I give it away, you know. You know what you gotta do now because of the limited supply or resource for uh, fish uh, guts and stuff. When you go along the Hamaku and so you see somebody selling fish, you know, for like two bucks a pound, stop. It'll teach you to clean fish, you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, and use that stuff. And make pokey at the same time. I'm down in Does any volunteer want to rinse this out for me? And then go fill it up with water and then go dump it on something. <laughs> Sweet potato or something over there. <clears throat> Then they like a fillet. How you like that? Oh! Can I have the soap out of that box? Mm -hmm. Also, guys, I was telling uh, Maddie yesterday about this wonderful thing that I use for when I make these materials. Um, everybody heard of a Rubaway stainless steel bar of soap? Rubaway is a company that. When I was a kid, my mom taught me that if I'm chopping onions or garlic, when I'm done, I take the soap and I rub my hands around the faucet. It will actually take the smell of the garlic and onions off your hands. I thought that, what a great thing. That's amazing. Well, somebody had the idea to create a bar. Looks like a bar of soap. It's stainless steel. It's ionized. So that uh, what it does when you rub it on your skin, it actually will have a charge and pull the molecules uh, off of your hand of the nutrients that are causing stink. So like garlic and onion sulfur, right? And so it's negatively charged and you rub it on your hands and it will pull the sulfur off of your hands. And it works great for when you're making fish emulsion. So if you, because when you use this, you make this, you get it on your hands, you're not going to get that stink <laughs> off for two days unless you rub it on stainless steel, rub it on your faucet or whatever, or maybe get one of these rub away bars. I love the thing, so I use it all the time. What's right? it called? Rub away? It's called rub away stainless steel bar. Where do you get that at? Online. Amazon. You know, I think they have them at, I keep asking the, the restaurant store if they have them, and he goes, I get them in every once in a while, but they sell out instantly. But you don't really need that, you just need stainless steel. So just know that you do this, rub it on, rub it on your nails, rub it all around, rub it on the side of your sink, and you'll get the stink off, okay? But I don't want to see people struggling. I know people that will be like, I love the idea, but I can't get the stuff off my hands, I'm not doing it. So I, don't, I would hate to think that's going to prevent you from doing what you need to do. Flawless. Okay, anybody want to wash their hands? You're more than welcome. What time is it? Quarter to Oh, gee, many Christmas. So we have left to do IMO, which is IMO 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we'll go through that. Uh, and I need more water first. So let's take a couple minutes. I'm going to want to fill up and then we'll start IMOs. Okay? Hey, what's wrong with the water over here? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> right there in the tap. Oh, yeah. No, right here. I'm not scared. Oh, yeah, well. You don't trust. <laughs> <laughs> you don't trust your cleanliness, eh? Is there? I like cold water. He says it's cold water. <laughs> My friend, he had, he, he had made a, and it's fermented fish emulsion, okay? And, and he, he, he put it in this cooler because it's easy to take out, yeah, on the bottom. Oh yeah, yeah I saw so, the picture. You know, yeah, and uh, so, but he covered it completely. There was no gas exchange or anything like that. In fact, what happened is that a lot of times the lid would pop, so he clamped it down and stuff like that. Yeah. He got one of those straps, one of tra straps, cords, and it held it down. And it worked though. But he said he used a, like a half a cup and to five gallons of 
the water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he put it in on a plant that can shield it. Too much. Too much. Too much. Too much. So he went back and he did it again, but you know, lesser amount, like less than a less than a quarter of a cup. In fact, yeah, maybe a couple of a few tablespoons, table for the bigger one. And then after that, he put it on the chair and scrubs. Came up. They, they're harvested so young, they don't, um, they, they don't uptake, their roots are so, like, so small and, um, Oh, no, do you use, uh, <laughs> they could. some people use kelp, no, what kind of acid would you use, sulfuric acid? It's, it's not really needed if you have a good quality yeah. 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 It's just when they get home, it's pretty good. Okay, they did, like, alright, let's do this. IMO, guys! Okay, so we have the chicken and the chicken. No poor thing when they eat your chicken. IMO means indigenous microorganism, and then the number uh, following is the uh, the number on which the steps to process the material. So IMO one being the first step, IMO two being a second, and so forth. All the way up to IMO five, as I indicated in class. But today we're only going to talk about four because you know five it's just it's with biochar, That's biochar one. and nitrogen yeah. fertilizer. Um, whether it be the liquid or... I do, the, the, the IMO4 I do does use a nitrogen fertilizer where most, like the CTAR write-up you have in front of you doesn't tell you to do that. As a soil scientist, I know you need to have more nitrogen than they tell you to have in there. So that's why I do it. Sorry, quickly, you said something about a Wednesday class. I just have a handout for weekends. You know, mm -hmm. for... Yes. So, so there are other classes? Yes, there's a series going on right now that is... Uh, this, he's got it right in front of you. It's the Science of Agriculture series okay. that you didn't know about. We did a first round of soil. We did plant physiology and like plant health. All I know is this. Yep. So you only got that flyer. That other series of classes is being offered. You just didn't see the flyer. Oh, okay. Um, we are going to run that series of classes again very, very soon, okay. either here or in Pahoa. Uh, I know I'm going to run it in Kono soon. So. Okay, so yeah. Those are the other classes. Okay. Feel free to sign up. On Wednesday, we start microorganisms. There you go. So we go over introduction to microorganisms, and then we have a day of soil oh, yeah, microorganisms, and then a day of plant-associated microorganisms. The soil ones are really just going to be focusing on decomposition. Uh, the series we're going to offer, can you, like, if you miss some at the beginning of it, can you say it again? Well, it's all a la carte, so you just pay per class. So, yeah, 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 yeah it would be the same lecture, okay. and then you would just Get pick up from the other end. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm talking with my office right now about running it again here and then maybe in the home. Okay. Let's put some lids on those while you guys are just... Look at her. She's like, that stuff stinks. <laughs> you know what? You've been pretty lucky this semester, man. I mean, like, every you hit these bottles the jars about three times and never hit you. know, just never fell back. You know? It's because I'm flailing. I'm a flailing. Okay. <laughs> IMO. So IMO one. Let's talk about IMO one. IMO one is the first stage of IMO process, and this is where I go out into the environment and collect those site-specific indigenous microorganisms to be used throughout the process. Site-specific microorganisms, of course, being the microorganisms that have evolved uh, in that region. I really, really, really dislike the word indigenous, but everybody uses it because who's to say what's indigenous? If somebody 40 years ago brought in a fungi from a plant and brought it on his land and now it's there, is that indigenous? Definitely not. So, um, and we have no way of knowing what was there before. So it's very, very tough for us to call it that. But we'll call it IMO, indigenous microorganisms. That's what everybody else calls it. So hey, I'll play along. Um, we do this by using a sterile media. Sterile media being comprised of carbohydrates and starches. Now, there are several tools, or several materials to use as your carbohydrate source in IMO1. The Korean natural farming method strictly says use rice. Rice works really well, but it's not locally available. Um, it's very, very inexpensive, so if you could justify it that way, I'm cool with that. I mean, if you're literally bitching and complaining about putting down $5 for some rice, 
Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's, it's five dollars to get you where you need to go, and you're not using that, that natural farming hardcore method. Hey, at least you're getting where you need to go. I'm not a stickler on it, but I have to say that the natural farmers out there would say that that's not natural farming. I'm not going to point fingers. But if you use rice, it's perfectly fine. I also use, and I'll show you what I use is, red fruit dried and shaved and then steamed. This, I, I made a bunch of it recently and then used it for an experiment. This is all I have left. So I would have loved to have made you guys a batch of IMO with this, but I used rice instead. But let's take a look at what we got here. So this is just red fruit. So how do you make it? You yeah. So I'll take a uh, breadfruit, fresh from the tree, cut it up into quarters, and I throw it in a large food processor with a shaver. And it gets it out a little shoestring like that, and, and then I dry it in the oven, or I put it out in the greenhouse. So I will uh, sun dry it, which is highly recommended. It's much more efficient, much more sustainable. And uh, essentially, I treat that as if it was dried rice. So from that moment on, it's just the same way. I steam it like I do rice, and I put it in my, my boxes like I do the rice. It's essentially treated the same way. I get really good cultures from it. I don't see why people shouldn't use it. If you can get access to breadfruit, use that for your IMOs. The issue is, are you willing to go through this and that and all that rigmarole so that you could fill up a small wooden box with that and then get a culture when you could do the same thing with rice. It's totally up to you. Whatever your agenda is. Do you use a green one? Yes, green one. At what step do you steam it? Uh, what? When do you steam it? I steam it right before I'm going to use it. Okay. Okay. Steaming it just like cooking rice, right? Just, I, I actually just, cook, like I'm cooking rice. So I, with water, boil it with water, just enough to, for it to absorb it and get Starchy, but not soggy. That abs you only need a little bit of water as compared to rice. Rice, you need a good amount of water when you're making it. Bread fruit, just a couple ounces of water to steam it. Like you're steaming broccoli or something. You just want a thin layer of water on the bottom, enough that it can boil and then get into the plant tissue. Okay? Um, so has that already been steamed? Or would you be steaming that? I would steam this. It would be the next step. I would steam this and then it would become sterilized. And that's the key, is the moisture and then the sterilization. Um, remember, I told you rice is covered in lactic acid bacteria, but when you steam it, it becomes a totally sterile starch media. So it's, it's like the bottom of a Petri dish. It's just as clean. So um, that's why a lot of people will use it, and that's why I use this, and I get the same result. Okay? Um, asked about green. It, not anywhere near edible. I mean, this is still a young breadfruit. Nice and solid, very, very hard. You could knock somebody out with it, it's that hard. That's, that's what we're looking for um, when we do the shaving. And remember, there's latex in there, and if you shave it and then let it sit out for even like a couple hours, that latex becomes an issue. So it's, you really wanna shave it and then cook it or put it in the greenhouse right away. And when you put it out, you don't want to stack it. You want to make sure it's a very thin layer on whatever tray you got, okay? There's a lot of nutrients in here. If you let it get anaerobic or, you know, a little bit too much moisture and stuff, you have major, major mold issues and stuff, and it goes, it goes haywire. Okay, so. Could you get lactic like, acid bacteria off it just like the rice? I don't know. I would say, I would say lactic acid bacteria would, would be on the outside because during the drying process, it, if you did it in a greenhouse, but if you did it in the oven, I don't think it would, it would probably kill a lot. But then again, in the oven, you only do it at like 120 degrees, so maybe it could survive. I don't What's know. What's happening with rice, that it's on the outside of the rice, and why is that such a be It's because when they process it, they do wash it and they actually make the outside of the rice moist for a second, and then the lactic acid bacteria is in the air and it will inoculate it from there. And it really doesn't, it actually protects the rice, okay? They want it to be there. So if a fungi comes along to the rice, the lactic acid bacteria is like, hey, yo, this is my nutrient source backup, right? 
So it's actually a good thing they want it there, and it's just a natural, pro during the, the processing of rice, it naturally occurs. I'd love to find out what the lactic acid bacteria content is on the outside of it. What I need is my own is lab. There, you got a million dollars like a bar? See, if there was like lactic acid bacteria on the outside of, the, of this, would it be any different than what, what's on the rice? Or? I, w I would think it might, it probably wouldn't be any different. I don't know. Good question. So I am a one. We start off with... Um, do I just have... Okay. We start off with one of many things. It's your choice. You can use a wooden box, like this one here. Oh, right, right, right. This is made out of cedar. Why do I use cedar? Because it has terpenoids in it, which has antimicrobial properties, which ensures that if I put a sterile media in here and I put a little bit of organic material on top, the only thing that I, it's in the equation is the material, not the wood itself. Okay, so we don't want the wood adding microorganisms to it, to our material. So, cedar box does really great, smells good. Um, I tend to, before I do an inoculation in my box, I'll actually take my boxes and put it in the oven face down at about 300 degrees for about 15 minutes. And before I do that, I'll hit it with a little water just so I don't start any fires. Put it in there, and what it does is sterilizes my box really, really well from the last time I made this. So you can reuse boxes um, as long as you, you know, keep it clean. Uh, you can use treated wood. I would highly, rec I would not recommend that because it's treated for my killing off microbes. So um, lots of harsh chemicals in there. So I wouldn't use that. So the uh, Home Depot fence, cedar fencing would not work. No, that's treated. That's so treated. always get untreated, and the best place to get uh, untreated cedar is HPM. If you buy, I think it's a 12 foot um, piece of it you can make a box this size. Yeah. So I think it's 18 inches diameter all the way around. So uh, wooden box, you could also use a hollow basket, which I've been using a lot lately. So that's much more sustainable, it's locally available. So you take, you know, you could do palm fronds or hollow and uh, have it woven into a basket. And like I said, works just as well. You wanna make sure that you have a lid though for it. Um, they sell them cheap, not yeah. at the, uh, right by a farmer's market, Yep. the hollow baskets. Yep. They're only a couple bucks. They only last a couple um, attempts at doing it, maybe five or six, where the cedar box will last a really long time. So it's up to you. But like I said, when you're making these materials, you don't make them all the time. So do what's easy, do what's cheap, do what works. Don't try to overthink it, okay? Um, so we take a wooden box like this, and we need a sterile media. Where's my media? You're right. Yeah, where is it? It's right there. Where? The yellow bag there. Right? No, it's cooked. It's a cooked rice? Yeah. In this bucket. Ah, here it is. Okay. I need a volunteer. So, when we make our rice. Stop pushing that out. Uh, go ahead and start putting that in until about three inches deep, all the way around, okay? And if it's chunks, try to break them up. Okay. When I'm making the rice, you can either use old rice from eating for dinner, uh, maybe you make a little extra because you know you're going to make some IMOs later, uh, or just got it left over like a lot of people do. I tend to actually make my rice for IMO because I find that rice for eating is a little too moist uh, for IMO. So where you, when you make rice and you, you know, my rule of thumb is you, know, you stick your finger in and your fingernail of water goes above the rice. That's a pretty good indication of how to make normal eating rice. I would say maybe have the water just at the level of the rice or just below. So a little bit less water than you would usually use when you're making rice. And for those of you that only make rice with a rice cooker, I am so sorry for you. You really need to learn how to make rice out of pot because it, it tastes so much better. Yeah, it, does. <laughs> it does. It truly does. So um, when you're making it on a pot and you're making it, like I have a big steel pot and I'll make a big vat of it at one time. So I sometimes will do three or four or five of these boxes at a time because I do research experiments. But rice right on top, three inches deep, and you want to make sure that there's no clumps and there's plenty of aeration in there. Better to use white than brown rice. Yes, I would say so. 
Only because it's cheaper. <laughs> it's about twice as much for brown rice, right? No? Not when you buy it both. Oh, that's true. But it takes twice as long and twice as much water, right? So whatever's easiest for you, you know. I just don't overthink it. Use what works. And I think I have enough here for two boxes. Um, Do you want this yeah, box? Yeah, let's, let's take that box. Since I have enough rice, we can do two. We'll break off into one piece if you guys collect. What is even more rubber band? So is this part where you take samples of your property and put it in there? Yes, yes, okay. we'll get there. And what is this whole thing called? I'm a one. But that's that's the property taking the property. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So the whole take thing until we get to a thing in a bucket is IMO one. Those little chunks are okay. What I'm talking is don't have any here, it's like a handful of size. Sometimes when you make it in the big vats like that, you get the bottom burnt ones and stuff. You want to make sure those are are broken. So, if your rice is soggy, put it on a cookie sheet, put it out in the sun for about five hours, six hours, and then it'll be that kind of nasty, chewy kind of rice that you would throw away because it's been sitting out. That's the rice you're looking for for this process. So you want it fully cooked though. You don't want like half cooked. I would say right? three-fourths cooked. Yeah. Have the center hard but the outside squishy. Wouldn't add any water. It'd be easier to get the kernels and separate it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you you want to watch your moisture on this. Like I said, you want it on the dry side versus on the wet side. In this phase, um, oh, I'll get to that. My daughter-in-law cooked some rice last night. And I want for cooking. You know, like came out like, like yeah. what you say, like a cake cooked. on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. half cooked. Half cooked. <laughs> so she had to make another bag. And this was from a rice cooker, man. Oh. How do you mess it up from a rice cooker? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> my, I've, I've been on a year-long mission trying to teach my wife how to make rice, and it's it's not working. She's get, coming along, but. Uh, she usually just says, James, you do it. There you go. <laughs> I don't want to mess it up again because you'll yell at me. <laughs> I'll go, how do you mess up rice? <laughs> All good? So you don't want to press it down yet? No, no, no. Aerated and you want a nice air spaces between each kernel. Okie doke. Go ahead and rinse off. <laughs> All right, next step is we need to protect our sterile media from the organic material in which we are about to put on there. So we use paper towel. <laughs> Go ahead and dry off. Probably like that's a bacteria. Yeah, that's good for you. So next we're going to add a paper towel right on top. Who's gonna to do this? I'm not doing this anymore. I know how to do this. This is a hands-on activity. Any other volunteers? There you go. So you want to put it on piece, thick all the way around. Rip it if you need, uh, but just one layer thick all the way around. If you can, fold it just up on the edges like this, so that um, if any organic material falls on the inside, um, the lip will hold it in and then you can easily gather it, as opposed to if it was too short, that organic material will tuck into your rice and it's not what you want. Mm -hmm. Question. Question. In here it says don't, come, don't put it right on the rice. You want it up, up. The organic material you do, correct. We'll get to that. 
shirt for this and it's very cheap. You can, but I would recommend using something of the paper variety, tissue paper, that kind of thing. See, the spores that we're going to inoculate onto here will go right through this material as if it's not there. And it's because the spores are so small and the airspace is so wide in these, these paper towel that um, really the, the, the goal here is to keep all the litter, the leafy material, from off of our rice. And that's the goal. You don't want to use colored type paper. Right? Doesn't matter. I use uh, that Christmas, you know, tissue wrapping paper all the time for this. Yeah, you get it in the holidays, you don't know what to do with it. I, I use it for this. Yeah. Where's my paper? <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Anybody want to take a picture of that? That's perfectly spread out. Hey, why don't you tilt that camera down so just so we can get a shot of this? Just bend it. There you go. Just bend the whole thing. Just lean it forward. <laughs> this right here. Just lean it. Lean the whole thing. Oh, lean, the whole thing. Oh, lean the whole thing. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't work these things. That was a wife's thing. Right <laughs> Come here. <laughs> Give me this. Sorry. Okay. Something like that. That leg's a lot. That leg's a lot. Sprinkler system. Okay, uh, so yeah, so now we want to prevent mammals and small creatures from getting into our rice. And for that, we use half inch grate and a staple gun. He's up. Make sure there's like four on each side, just enough so that a uh, rat can't, with his incredibly strong neck, can't push it up. This one used for the strainer. I had another one. I think it's in the mall. Oh, it's in the truck. Gill's thing says, do not let it come in contact. We're not going to let it come in contact. We're actually going to put the organic material on top of the grating. So it doesn't come in contact with the rice. If a rat wants to try hard enough to get this box, he's going to chew through the side anyway, <laughs> and it happens. So uh, you can only do what you can do, really. But as far as keeping uh, the mice out, this is a great way to do it. Again, can you put it in another container? Or do you need it? Can you put this in another container? Uh, you're going to eventually put it out into the field, so we're not quite done with it yet. All right, let's grab two buckets. Two volunteers, one grab a bucket. All of us are gonna go around, we're gonna go collect some microorganisms, okay? typically collect microorganisms are going to be areas of decomposition.
let's assume that this pile of rubbish is naturally occurring in the forest, okay? So if I was to go on my property and find a large leaf litter area, I would like looking for uh, leaves, sticks, stems, roots, all different leaf structures that are in the middle of decomposition, okay? So for instance, right here. How can I tell that this is going through decomposition? It's soggy, it's wet, I got my cilia all over it. It's dark. There's obviously bacteria in going on, uh, decomposition going on in here. Okay. Leaves and sticks. Different kinds of parent material. So, I would collect from an area like that. Stolens are for grasses. On the area below, there's an awful lot of decomposition going on. So, broken down microorganisms that are breaking down grassy material, I would want to use that as well. Also, it's not dumb to grab a little bit of the soil because what am I doing there? I'm grabbing surface microorganisms from the soil that have a symbiotic relationship with the soil and the organic material. This is the type of stuff I'm aiming for. The ones that have that relationship with the soil and the plant. It's also best to collect in shady areas away from the sun. With a, with a waterway on your property. So you got like a drainage ditch or a little bit of a creek or something. What a wonderful place to collect from. If you have bamboo, collecting just from the root base of the bamboo is a wonderful place to collect from. Um, I generally, I generally, now that I've been making IMOs in the same place, it's gotten to the point now where I don't even inoculate from nature anymore. I inoculate from the floor of my IMO barn. So I'll go out into the environment and make 10, 12, 15, 20, 25 batches of IMO. My whole floor is inoculated with every single spore that I brought in on all of those trips. So if you can actually establish yourself in an IMO barn, you get a nice soil floor. I'm getting the best cultures I've ever gotten off that floor. So. Yes, they're indigenous. They were cultured by me at some other time, but they actually found a nice little niche in that in that area, and I'm able to reculture them. So I read also there's a health hazard. Health hazard? It's like because if you have all these uh, spores and stuff like that, you could yes infect yourself. Yeah, we'll so, talk about that in okay. a sec when I get to the spory part. Gotcha. So if you have a compost bin, it's a great place to, to sample from. 
is provided that the compost is from materials from your area. Because if not, it's those microorganisms are going to be breaking down foreign material and then you're probably bringing in microorganisms that are going to break down that material faster than the ones that were naturally there. Don't have to fill it all the way up, maybe three-fourths. So put your kitchen in the right? Oh, certainly not. Food. Yeah, we want, we want stuff that's been out there decomposing, um, breaking down cell walls. Okie doke, we're full. Good enough, that's fine. All right, let's bring it over. What's that fencing? That'll get your ankle and make a nice hole. Yeah. Okay, so we are now going to place the organic material on top of the box. And what we're doing there is we're placing the material on top of the box so that they can freak out because I'm just about to change the condition on which it originally was sitting. Well, first of all, we took it out of the area it was in. So it's already going, hey man, this is kind of uncomfortable. And I'm also gonna do a couple other things to make it freak out. What happens when a fungi freaks out? <laughs> Correct, because it can't move. It's not like an animal that can get up and leave. It sends out spores so that it can send its genetics to another area and be more comfortable and to just say, screw me, I'm done. And let, let my propagules handle the next generation. So what we're gonna do is, first of all, we took them out of the environment. Now we're going to turn up the sauna. We're going to take plastic sheeting. We can put that back in the truck. Plastic sheeting. And we'll place it right up over top. Like so. Okay. Now, we could do one of two things. We could put a rubber band around this, which will actually lock out a lot of the air and the airflow and cause, I think, a little bit of a moisture issue. Or we could staple the sides down very loosely. One or two per side. <laughs> but see, you're not allowed in my workshop. <laughs> I found myself explaining what a film was. Okay, screw it, I'm doing it myself. Okay. Anybody else want to do this one? Oh, me, me, me. Oh, yeah. 